experience music differently. Say, for example, you've got tickets for a concert, you know who you're going to go see, it begins at 8 o'clock. You know, now, that's one kind of musical experience that most of us have had. But what's the difference? Do we experience music differently, say, if you suddenly come upon it? You're walking in a park, and all of a sudden you find a band playing. I mean, is there, do you experience physically the music differently? Because on one hand, you're, you're, you know what you're going to get pretty much. You, you have expectations about the performance. Maybe you're even familiar with the music, but it's a different orchestra, or there's a classical concert, a different conductor, whatever. Then for you to suddenly come upon music, completely unexpected, and it might be a music that you're, you know, unfamiliar with. I mean, is there a difference in experiencing music that way? Or do we take it in the same way? Is it processed in the same way? Well, in terms of brain function, it's, it's all happening in the same way. Yeah. Uh, you're certainly influenced by the context and your expectations. But there's a lot of implicit unconsciousness. So if you hear a beat, even a non-musician will start tapping your foot. And it's probably happening before it gets up here to where you're, you're analyzing the melody and the harmony and so on. There's this, mm, 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 which right. might go back to things but, like walking and basic primordial functions. But, but let, me, let me just, if I can just follow up on Bobby's question. You talked about expectations, and, and you know, I'm looking at that slide, all the different parts of the brain that are at work when we're listening to music. When you're talking about memories and associations and expectations, I think what Bobby's getting at is if you don't have time to erect those in your mind right. before right. the experience of the music has hit you, right. can you, you know, does that change your experience of the music because you, your mind hasn't had a chance to, to erect those, those edifices yet? I think the expectations happen at two uh, time courses, right? So there's a long-term expectation of having bought your tickets a month in advance, and you're sort of mentally preparing yourself for the night of the concert. Right. You might listen to the music of the performer or the composer ahead of time, and you're sort of playing in your head what you think is going to happen. And this is a sort of long-term expectation. And then at the moment of the concert, whether it's music you've heard before or not, whether you're a musician or not, whether you know the difference between a C sharp and a G and an H or not, right? Uh, <laughs> you've got these short-term expectations H? going. <laughs> You have these short-term expectations that are sort of partly innate and partly acculturated. You don't always know what's going to happen, but because there's typically a pulse, you know when the next event is going to be. And your brain is trying to form predictions about the micro timing of are they going to play it a little early, are they going to play it a little late, are they going to play around with the time instead of doing this while they do. You know, all this kind of rhythmic play. We'll talk about that. But I think the other thing that's interesting about Bobby's question is that it illustrates that there are really different kinds of people who come to music and life with very different mindsets. There are people who um, approach life in a more open and experimental way. They hear music wherever it is, and they're not surprised by it. They hear it in the wind rustling through the trees. They hear it in the birds singing. They come upon it in the park. They're ready for it. And there are other people who have to sort of steel themselves up for the event, right? I mean, it's in psychobabble, we would call it a difference in openness to new experience or in readiness to, to accept something uh, at the spur of the moment. You know, I must say, I'm sorry, I must say that when I saw Miles Davis's band for the first time in Los Angeles in 1971 or whatever it was, literally, physically, I felt different when I left. Uh, that wasn't just from what was night. being no. smoked in the auditorium? No, not at all. <laughs> and it, 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 was a, it was a small club. It was a small club in Los Angeles. And I felt that physically I was different. Because I had, even though I knew I was going to go see Miles on a particular day of the week and I was going to go see him, I had no idea what he was going to play or what the group was. And I literally, literally left the club a changed person. I was never the same because I'd never heard music like that. I never experienced music like that. I mean, Miles walked out, they improvised for an hour and, you know, played all kinds of stuff all over the place. You and, might have had And I felt like my molecular structure literally had been transformed. And I never experienced music like that ever again. And I never played music that way. I mean, it made me question and re-examine everything that I ever did musically, you know, after that. 
You may have had a big burst of dopamine production during <laughs> and, and right. I think your physiology did change. What, when, you know, what, what neuroscientists think of as learning is new connections in the brain. Yeah. Well, also, you, you were, you know, as an artist, as a young artist, you were, pre you were prepared for that kind of experience, the change, because you obviously had a lot of potential. And, you know, I was, and it I must, hits you upside the head, and it, you just it, drove you in a new direction. Yeah, 